None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my stairway. way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Amen. Before we get started, it is a new year. Well, for Gentiles, anyway. Yeah. Anybody have a blessing over the last 12 months they want to share, something they want to praise God for? Anybody at all? Jennifer? Um, brief opportunity to, I didn't get to go through the whole gospel, but uh, to give gospel tracks with little gifts last week to the, my co residents at work. So, cool. for new opportunities and new questions. Amen. Something you're thankful for the last 12 months, maybe, starting a new year. Go ahead, Brother Polly. Amen. Amen. Well, you got saved, man, so you came to the right place, right? <laughs> yeah. Brother James, go, uh, Guido. Uh, a brother who works so pot here who works with me at the rescue mission. The Lord has really been blessing him to cure him of cancer. Guy's on fire. He, he can't shut his mouth for the Lord. He led six people to the Lord a couple months ago. Amen. Yeah. James, go ahead. Uh, for stacking on what Paul said, for helping me find this church and uh, no. helping me grow in, in my spiritual growth. Yeah. God is not dead. <laughs> Never going to die again. He on that cross, man. God's not dead. He's still working in people's lives, man. Um, Luke chapter 15, as we get started this morning. Still going through, going through the growth process. And appreciate your patience with this. Uh, it is a lot different. I did this in one night uh, back in our old church up the road. I don't know how we did it, an hour and 15 minutes or hour and 10 minutes or whatever. So we've milked this one for a few weeks, but it's good. Uh, I hope me going through this personally... It's, uh, it's been good for myself, and honestly, you have more, you should have more 15 years down the road from when you first taught something than when you first taught it. And hopefully, it's not, I'm not dragging this out because I have nothing else to preach, you've got a lot to preach in this book, but it just causes you to examine where you're really at with the Lord, and as the Lord tells you what, how He views you, versus how you view yourself or how somebody says you look to them. I care about His opinion and his call in my life. That doesn't mean you're just a rancorous jerk to everybody else. No, it goes together. But you want to make sure that you're in tune with his viewpoint of where you're at in your life. It doesn't matter what man says about you, or your wife, or your kids. What does he say about you? Because he knows you. The Bible says this. Let's look at a couple of verses here. We'll, we'll read as, as quick as we can. But talking about the prodigal here and, and, and where we're at this morning, we're looking at the elder or what you'd call a father position in the spiritual saved person's life. This stage is uh, where it brings the believer into ministry leadership. Uh, when you first get saved, you don't stick a babe in charge of a Sunday school class. If you do, you're kind of a fool as a preacher not to understand that that's just not the right place for them at the moment. Uh, I would say further on, before we get into this, is that just because you graduate from a Bible school doesn't make you instantaneously a father or an elder. A lot of folks get out of Bible school, and I don't care how old you are when you went to Bible school, or if you did, or whatever the case is, and they get out and they have a degree and they think, oh, I'm ready to pastor people and to teach people. No, you might be able to do a lesson or two. But to actually be a father or an elder in somebody's lives or in multiple people's lives, it, it, it is a serious, serious stage. Uh, it does take maturity spiritually. I know many of us joke about Looney Tunes and all that stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm a 12-year-old. I know that mentally. But spiritually, you want to get to this spot so you can actually affect people's lives for eternity. 
You can't do it as a babe or even as a young child. You might have a little smattering here and there, but this is, this is serious stuff, man. This is participation in leadership. Look what the Bible says. Now, we're going to look at, look at the two men. I know, I know you know the account, then we'll pray. It's the prodigal son. And verse, num, verse number 11, 15 and 11 says this, and he said, he says, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me, and he divideth unto them his living. And not many days after the younger, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when there was yet a great way, uh, but, uh, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight no more, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. And the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field. Did you just see that? The elder son. The older one. So the young one, okay, he's a little off his rocker and he just wants to go sow his oats and he, you know, he sees the whole world in front of him and all that stuff. The elder one, no, nah, he's the one that stayed home. He stayed by the stuff. Just, I'm using this to, like we've done the last several weeks, to launch off and say that just because you're older chronologically doesn't make you spiritually older. Look what the Bible goes on to say about this elder Brother, he says, the Bible says, verse 25, Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fat calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. The father is the subject of this passage. Did you notice what the father did? The father went to the prodigal, and the father went to the disgruntled. This is not about the sons. This is about the father and how great the father is. Look what the Bible goes on to say. Verse 29, and he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, why are you call me your son? You're so angry at him? That's your brother. This thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots. Thou hast killed for him the fad calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meat that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Thank you again, Father, for the morning. Pray your blessing upon this time. We are around the book. Please, Father, teach and preach through me as only you can through the power of the Spirit of God. Father, I yield my members as instruments of righteousness for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. You might have the preeminence in the church, which is his body. Thank you for the good Sunday school. Thank you for the blessings of the, the, uh, the testimonies. Thank you, Father, for being such a great God and a great King and a great Savior, and a great Redeemer. Thank you, Father, for grafting us in as pigs and dogs, Gentiles, just out of the way, without Christ having no hope, without God in the world. Thank you, Father, for including us in this. Thank you for the gospel, the grace of God. Thank you, Father, for this account of the prodigal son. Father, as we kick this off, and kick this year off in our hearts and our minds, may we be different in 12 months from now than we are today. And Father, I pray we be home in glory in the next 12 months. <laughs> Just get out of here. But in the meantime, help us to stay faithful to you, Father, as you're faithful to us. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Have a seat. We'll get into this. Look at this elder or father. Now, I wanted to kick off like we've done the last few weeks, looking at several verses of how God views things versus the way you and I view things. The one that had the biggest problem here, if you read that passage with me the way that we just read it, is... I believe the elder brother is the problem. You see, the real prodigal here is the elder. The elder brother was prodigal in his heart, but what did he just do? He just stuck it out for show. Because when the heat came and the glory and the merriment and the happiness was going to the one that came back, you saw what that boy was really like. You knew what was under the hood and what was cooking once the attention went from him 
to this boy that had just spent all his father's inheritance. I mean, imagine getting a life insurance policy, but getting it up front. Not Karen, if I die, thank God for her that I die, and she'd be relieved from all her, uh, all her burdens in the tribulation period. But she'll be, a, she'll be a, a, pretty, a pretty rich lady. Not as rich as if I'm alive, but she'll be rich in my territory. But you know what? Imagine if she wanted that now while I'm alive. And then I, we just gave, you know, the life insurance agreed to it and said, you know what, here, take the money and go do what you want with it. Well, guess what happens when I die? She doesn't get that life, because you took it early. And I, I get all this stuff about the prodigal, and we've all gone prodigal in our hearts and our minds, but I wanted to point this out as we get going this morning, is that the older one should have had a better heart. The one that was older chronologically, the one that you read the testimony, and, and the father doesn't argue with him. The older one is actually, he's there all the time. He puts in his 10, 12 hours a day. He watches the, the flock. He, 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 you know what? I don't really get on him that much. He has a rightful grievance with his dad. I do this every day, all day. Why don't you recognize me? Well, maybe the father did recognize you by not saying anything. But he says, you can always count on my elder brother. But the elder brother is, this is the way the, the account lays out, he has to pipe up and he has to say, you know what, I want what's due to me and I can't believe this knucklehead, your son. You know, when you get really angry with somebody, it's not my brother, it's, you know, your, your son, your daughter. You know, when the dogs act bad at home, that's her corgi, that's her dog. When they're good, they're my dog. But, I mean, that's the way we look at it, and we get involved in this thing, and, and you, you, you're going you're gonna to celebrate this idiot who wasted all your inheritance up front? Yeah, you know what? He was dead. Now he's alive. I'm glad to have him back. But I'm also glad you're always here. But being older doesn't necessarily mean that you are wiser, you understand that, or you have that link with the Father that you should have. Now, that's going to play out as we go to a couple passages here. But just because you're older folks doesn't mean in the Lord. Some of you folks have been saved, honestly. Brother Bert, you've been saved since what? When you made the ark with Shem, Ham, and Japheth? You're, how many? 69 years? No. 1960. I know, I know the batteries are draining and you're recouping right now. I know, you know. But so it's 69, so that's, uh, let's see, it's 50. Wow, it's 50. Wow. You've been saved a long time, huh? Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, I mean, that's it. You know it. But Brother Guido, you've been saved since, what, 82, 80, 83, I guess saved in 84. We, you're going on 40 years of salvation, man. You would think just by, Brother Steve, how uh, you've been, what, since Solomon made the temple? 81. 81. So we've been saved, for, this is called 40 years, fit, you know, I mean, we've been saved a long time. Devin, I'm going to ask you, never ask me, never, never ask a woman her spiritual age, you know, just don't do that. Because then you'll start clicking back on, But I'm just saying, as you get into this thing, you would assume just because, well, you're older, you'd know better. Well, the older one's the wiser one. The older one's the one that is mature. The, one, the older one, he's the one that should be the leader. He's not the leader here. He's actually the brat that comes out when the pressure's on, and he doesn't get what he wants. If that's the case with you, you're probably not ready for this stage of elder and father. It's hard, man. It's hard seeing people get up and preach and teach when you know you could do it better. And that's why you're not at the stage of an elder and a father, because you still have that in you. Well, I, 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 I know more Bible than they do. Okay, elder brother, what's it going to take to get you to go prodigal? When somebody else gets to I could have sang that song better than they did. Did you hear him misread that passage? I'd never misread a passage. Did you hear him skip that word? I don't skip words. You see, the growth process is not the longevity of, I've been, I've been saved 65 years. Yeah? I know 15 verses on the mark of the Antichrist. Hmm. Really? And what does that mean in God's economy and in God's growth process with you? Let me give you a hint. It's found in Isaiah. It's less than nothing. Well, I, I believe... I should be the one that runs the show. Uh, that's why you're not ready for this stage. I've said that on every stage because we were talking, I think we were at the Harlem Globetrotters on Tuesday night. We weren't playing with them. We were just <laughs> preaching outside. But we were talking about a little bit about this is that it, it's strange how all these growth processes we've been going through, you kind of go back to them. Even when you might be at a stage, you all visit them every once in a while. 
You don't think that's true, go to a nursing home. And people that are 75, 80, 85, 90 years, and what do you have to do to them? Feed them. Change their diapers. They are physically 80, 90 years old, and what they're, you're, you got to treat them like a baby. The same thing with, spirit, with safe people. Uh, safe people, you think they'd be further down the road with the Lord, but they're not. And even if you are further down the road, every one of us has the proclivity, the propensity to go backwards and visit any one of these young child, children, young men. We have any, we have. We have all those things in our flesh at our disposal to go back at any time and act just like a stinking baby. Well, this elder should have known better. I mean, isn't he the faithful one that works 10, 12 hours a day and takes care of everything and just, he just does his job? Well, yeah, but the pressure came out and the glory went to somebody else and guess what? The real him came out. Let's look at some stuff about this father and elder stage this morning. I think it's pretty cool. Let's look at some verses on... The father first, the father figure. Go to 1 Corinthians 4. As Brother Bert said, we, we use the Bible a little bit around here, not much, a little bit. I said, I said we're, Brother Steve and I were talking before, uh, before service as he came up to the holiest of all, the pulpit area, and he came up, and uh, the bells were jingling, man, but then they stopped and you walk back, so I don't know what that means. But we were talking about, uh, about this whole thing about the you know, our, 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 our services, and typically when I get between Sunday school and between Sunday school and the Sunday morning hour, we probably go through, oh, I said probably 30, 35 verses. Oh, no, it's more than that, brother. <laughs> I'm like, is that good? Was that a good voice or was that a bad thing between what you read? But I figure the best teacher is the book. I figure the best interpreter is the book. That doesn't mean God didn't gift you to be a pastor or a teacher. I, he has. But the best teacher of this book is the Spirit of God going line upon line, line upon line. As you saw this morning during Sunday school where you thought quiet just means I don't run my mouth. That's not it at all. It's not it at all, man. 1 Corinthians 4. Let's look at some Bible verses this morning. Verse 14 says this, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons I warn you, for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I begotten you through the gospel. That boy says to those folks at Corinth, guess what? I've begotten you through the gospel. I've invested in your lives in spiritual things. I am your father. You know how this, this stage is different? What was the other word he used in there? Though you have 10,000 what? Instructors. Yet have ye not many what? A lot of folks can get up and give you some Bible, but how many are willing to walk with you in your life with Jesus Christ to not only disciple you in the things of the book, but also to help you walk in the walk the Lord has called us to walk? That's that father-elder mentality where you take somebody, and yes, it is Bible-related, and yes, we do teach the Bible to people, but you also show them how to live that Bible. Now, isn't that strange that Paul would say, my beloved sons? Do you know Paul was not married? I mean, I know Eusebius and Josephus and all the other Osses and Esuses and all the, you know, Elvin Titus and everybody else says he was. No, well, all the Pharisees were because that's what the, no, no, Paul was not married, 1 Corinthians 7. So it has to be a spiritual thing when he says, my beloved sons, because he has no physical seed. So the investment here, my friend, is based upon a spiritual investment in somebody's life where you as a father figure in the Lord can train somebody up like a son, like you would do physically. Every one of these stages has to do with a physical thing in life. Uh, Mike, you've got some young, you've got some young kids, man. We've, some of us have got older kids. You see that through the progression of a natural life, yet God is the one that mapped it out in a spiritual life. And so now, as you begin to invest in people's lives, you begin to not just teach them, but you're actually investing in their lives. They're going to call you at 1 or 2 in the morning. You're going to have to be there for them. Now, right there, that makes you just go, yeah, I don't know if I want to be all in on that. <laughs> yeah, man, it means more than just throwing them a couple verses. Uh, back in the day, we would go well, at one of our old churches. They keep saying one of, one of your old churches. Well, that's why we started this one, so I, I couldn't fire the pastor, you know what I'm saying? So if I leave the church, I have to leave, you know, I have to leave the pulpit. But I mean, back in one of our old churches, um, they would take a discipleship lesson, which I have no problem with the lesson. It's just a tool. And some of them are some of them are very good. But this is the mentality of the discipler towards the disciple. Uh, take this, do this, and get back to me in a week. I'm not making that up. 
That's for real. And you, Brother Guido, you, you, know, you, you know that. They take, give them a booklet and say, do this and get back to me. Well, do this and get back to me? I don't even know where Genesis is. But do this and get back to me, and then we'll discuss it. Discuss what? I don't even, what, what, what? There's that relational situation between a father and a son that doesn't just stop with, I led somebody to Christ. Now, I understand if you lead somebody to Christ on the street, it's very difficult unless you can get them into a church or they're local where they can join a, a church. It's difficult. So I understand you got to pray that that person gets hooked up with a Bible-believing assembly. That is not going to stop me from witnessing, but it does enter my heart and my mind that if I lead somebody to Christ, I want to be able to invest in their life. Or if somebody led them to Christ and that somebody is somewhere else, but they're in my area, I'd like to go and train them up in the Word of God and, and be a father to them spiritually. Now, you're going to laugh. How many of you know Brother Maines? You know Brother Maines. If you go back to the, the photos in 1931, 32, 38, he's there. He's there in Germany. He's, he's, he's there. No, he's really not a man. <laughs> kind of. But I mean, I can remember that. That boy got saved in 2005, I believe. Either Regan or somebody led him to Christ. And I just remember him coming... Darren's a bit much on the eye when you first see him. So he came, comes by, and I was just standing by the radiator, just chilling like I was chilling up against the radio, you know, cool, just cool like this in church, smoking a bogey, you know. No. Okay. So, yeah, it's cool. I was just doing my cool guy thing, like usual, and I, I said, hey, uh, so uh, here you got saved. And he goes, yeah, I, I did. I said, so uh, let's start meeting this Saturday night. He said, that's the stupidest thing ever. Cut right to the chase, man. He goes, you know what? I want to do that. But I need three weeks because he was working on the road doing FedEx Kinko installs and, you know, making in the strip malls the FedEx Kinko, back when FedEx Kinkos and all that was, was popular. And we started from that day, and I think we went for three, three and a half years straight. About the time the Lord put up with the disciples, I said, that's about it, man. Three and a half years, you're gone, man. <laughs> but, I'm, and I'm not claiming to be a father to him, but we still talk to this day. And I, I, I talked to a man, John Hall, I, 35 years, still talk to him. Rob, I'm not, this is not about me. I'm saying, if you're going to be at this stage... You are going to have to give yourself to people and say, you know what, whatever you want. Brother James, we've been meeting. Brother James, Lindsay, we've, we've been trying to meet on, on, on Tuesday nights. And all that stuff. I mean, you have to invest. You have to take them under your wing like a father would do with their son. It's not just, I pastor a church. Well, that's great, man. Well, what are you doing to help those folks grow along the way, man? Paul says, you're my beloved sons. I love you, and I'll show you how much I love you. I'm going to invest in you. I'm going to invest my life in you. I'm going to give my life for you. Go with me to, um, oh, man. Go to first, uh, uh, go to Philippians 2. Philippians 2. Hell stutter there. The synapses weren't firing. I'm all right, man. Once you see Bert slap himself, you know it's over, man. <laughs> it's just, it ruins your whole life, man. He has hit himself so much, he can't believe his jaw's still in place, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome, man. Plus, all the times Deb hits him, I mean, seriously. That guy, <laughs> guy, guy's like a punching dummy, man. It's awesome. <laughs> Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 19, the Bible says this. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. He's checking in via Timothy. Do you know where Paul was when he writes this? He's in jail. Do you remember the Philippian jailer in his house getting saved? You know what the title of this epistle is? That he's either in jail or on his way to jail or just coming out of jail. It's, in other words, it's not good. But you know what he still has time to say? I want to check in on you guys. And the Bible says this in verse number 20. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own not the things which are Jesus Christ, but ye know the proof of him, that's Timotheus, that he's going to send to find out how they're doing, that as a son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel. What a great relationship that is. I'm glad to see you guys come out on the street with us. We had a, we had a few out yesterday in, in, uh, in Willimantic. Uh, brother, brother Kenny came out, and, uh, and Brother Polly and, and Johnny. Now, I, I've not really invested much in Brother John's life, per se, but two of the guys I've had the opportunity to disciple and train over the years, they were out with me. Other guys come out with me. Most of the people in this church are either some family members or folks have had the opportunity to either lead to Christ or disciple or train, or they've trained me. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's the investment of one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two in somebody's life. 
And he says, you know what? I trust Timotheus because I've watched him, and he's watched me. And I know that as a son with the Father, he will do exactly the way he's been taught. I don't get into all this crazy stuff about helicopter and a preacher. I, I've never liked that. And, unless there's just something uh, weird or strange or just off the cuff different going on in that assembly. We should have men trained by men, the pastor, the preacher, whoever it is, the elder, that can take over for that assembly when the head guy either goes to the mission field or another church, God moves away, or that man dies. There should be a succession plan for the pulpit of your church, sir. You do that by investing in being a father in somebody's life and training them to not replace you because there's only one Dr. Ruckman. Sorry. There's only one James Knox. There's only one Dr. Peacock. There's only one of those guys. There's only one Moses. God didn't ask Joshua to be Moses. He said, yes, his spirit is on you, but you're going to be Joshua. But you ought to keep the work going on while serving me. And Paul said, you know what, I have, no, I have no problems. You know what, I have no problems sending Timothy. But he didn't talk like you. In fact, he's taller than you. And he's a half Jew and a half Gentile. And you're full of Benjamite. Yeah, we're not alike like that, but we're alike concerning him, Jesus Christ. And we're alike concerning that book. And what he says to you, he got from me because we watched each other. In fact, I trained him. I took him on missionary trips. I know what he's like around his family. I know what he's like around others. You know what, listen to him. And I have every confidence sending him out. You know why Paul could say it? Because Paul's a father spiritually, to these boys. Folks, do you guys remember Jim Jones? You know, the Kool-Aid boy? You know? How do you think he got all those people to drink that cyanide? Or whatever it was. How do you think, uh, what was the guy that had everybody dress up in the Nike, uh, the Nike things? Hyman Applewhite? Was that his name? The guy had the, Nike, the Nikes and the hoodies? I, I don't know, but they were like black Nikes and stuff like that. I mean, booming sales for Nike. Yeah. But, um, and, and the hoodies, and they all laid down on their cots and, and they, because they were waiting for like a, a, a ring or a, a UFO. I mean, Farrakhan's boys are waiting for UFOs to come take all the nation. Was, I wish they would. I wish the aliens would come take them out of here. But let them get saved and go up in a rapture instead. What, what I'm saying to you is this is that how can those worldly lost, devil-possessed knuckleheads get people to follow them? Because they showed them kindness and compassion and investment, and they were there for them like a father and a son. It became a... Charles Manson. What did they call that group? Go ahead. Squeaky Fromm just spoke up from us. <laughs> if you don't know who Squeaky Fromm is, you spent too much time on your phone, you need to read, man. Squeaky Fromm and Linda Kasabian. I, I know, I know. But they, Charles Manson called his whole group the family. We can't even get people to get together on a Sunday consistently to hear the Word of God preached. Well, you ain't ready for the family and elder position, man. You ain't ready for that growth stage. You're not willing to invest. You're not, I mean, come on, man. This is the way God built this thing. I know we don't all get along, man, like each other. and you know, you know, I, I get that, but you've got to put that aside for Jesus Christ, man. And this stage is huge, man. You are actually leading somebody. You are participating in leadership, and you're, you're, you're involved in their life, man. See, right, you know what your flesh just said right there? i got too much on my own plate to do anything about this. I'm good with a young child. I'm good with a babe. I, I, I don't want to have to give up my time for somebody else. It's not your time. And it's not my time. It's his time. You're bought with a price. Love to quote that verse. Don't live it. Redeeming the time because the days that love to quote it, don't like to live it. It's not your time. He owns you. He bought you with the greatest price of all time, his sinless blood. And guess what? He owns you. So this stage shouldn't be a problem, man. But it is, unfortunately. First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter number two. First Thessalonians chapter two. The father stage, the elder stage. I'm an elder in the church. Do you meet the biblical definition of an elder in the quote unquote church? First Thessalonians chapter number two, verse 10 says this, ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe, 
as ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his heavenly kingdom. You know part of the deal is when you're a father physically, you charge your children, you exhort your children to do right. You should provide guidance and structure and a, and a path and a plan the best you can. Now, I understand you have no control of how your kids turn out, but spiritually speaking, you want to invest in them the best you can. I can tell you right now, folks, over the years when you get invested in people's lives, you're going to suffer heartbreak. You're going to have people you've invested in, you've poured out, you've prayed with, you've gone to the house, you've given them money, you've done things for them, and you know what? They're an absolute zero for Jesus Christ. You know what? You still keep on going down the road. Because if Jesus Christ had 12 folks and one of them was a devil and they all forsook him and fled, what do you think you and I are going to go through? You're going to have people leave you and leave the church and leave the assembly. You've got to keep pressing on for him, man, even though it tears your heart out of your stinking chest. It wrecks you when people don't show up to church. And, and I understand sickness. We're not talking about that. You know exactly what I mean. I'm talking about just people just don't want to come. But what's the problem, man? Well, if it's not here, go find another Bible-believing church and go join that one. But you know what it is? It's just that... It's just a bad heart, man. You just don't want to be told. You just, this you just don't want to be authority and subject to anybody, man. You won't have God tell you what to do. But in saying all that, you get involved in people's lives, and it, it, man, it'll tear you up when you hear about people you've invested in that are just gone to the wind, man. It just ruin you, man. But doesn't stop you from being a father or an elder. Well, let's go get the next one. I've had the opportunity over the years to disciple a lot of people. I don't know why. This is what God's given me to do and have an opportunity in. And of the, the multitude of them, I can maybe count five that are still serving Jesus Christ right now with any faithfulness at all. Oh, you should quit. Isn't that depressing? Oh, no. Let's keep on going down the road, man. Because you can only take a child so far. But he said, you know what? As a child, as our son, we exhorted you. We did the best we could with you, but we know you're going to make your own free will decision. We, we know you're going to do what you want to do, but you know what? We're going to keep doing it for him. That maybe somewhere down the road you'll remember that training like the prodigal in the hog pen and say, I want to go back to my father and get this thing right. And you know what's really cool? The father will be right there waiting for you. That's so cool, man. What's all that, what's all that hog mess on you and all that mud and all that stuff? You smell like garbage, man. But you know what? Come on in, son been dying to see you. In fact, I've been looking for you every, I've been looking for you every day. Well, it's part of this thing, spiritually investing in people's lives, man. It's not funny to see people fall away and, and not come back. It's, it's, it, it stings, man, but you've you got to keep going for the Lord Jesus Christ down the road. All right, let's take a look at uh, 1 John, 1 John 2, 1 John 2, 1 John 2. First John 2, I know we've been here quite a bit, and these three or four verses really sum up a lot, at least two or three of the growth stages. But look at this one about the fathers. 2.12 says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him, that is, from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I, write, I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Did you see what, the, did you see what fell on the, the father? The relationship and the growth and relationship between that one and the father. You've known him from the beginning, and you've stuck through the, all the hard stuff, and now you're ready to... Participate in leadership. Folks, Jesus Christ was born as a babe in Bethlehem, was he not? Micah 5 2. The next time you see him in your Bible is where? He's two years old, correct? After two years old, when's the next time you see him? He's 12. The next time you see him, how old is he? Would you say he's grown in every one of those stages from a babe to a young child to a man to a man? And now what's he going to be? A leader of men. Uh, you guys, uh, drop your nets and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Uh, Matthew, you're at the uh, receipt of custom, and you're, you're doing the taxes uh, with Taylor coming up in April. You're going to be, you're going to be, you're going to be you're an accountant. But you know what? Uh, leave that. Come follow me. 
All that growth in his life led to the place where at 30 years old, baptize me, suffer uh, to be so for now, it fulfilleth all righteousness, now let's go, you guys follow me now. I'm now a leader of men. But yet he never lost submission to the Father. That's the stage we're at right now. And he says, you know what, you've known him from the beginning. And what did Jesus Christ say in John 17? Father, you're ever with me and I'm ever with you. Would you, could we, could we have the fellowship we had before the beginning of the world because he's eternal, but the word became flesh. That's what's going on with it. The father has such a link with the heavenly father that he's able to dispense that to the ones that are under him and around him. It's a lot different than just having Bible knowledge, man. I love Bible knowledge. I love it, man. My eyes are, is, they're coming out of my head with it, but you know what? There's no practicality to it. If it doesn't become sound doctrine, who really stinking cares? You're a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Isn't that strange coming from me, man? Got a Bible with 20, 25,000 notes. Got another one at home with another 20,000 notes, man. Another one with another five or seven. Well, who cares? Unless it becomes real to you where you can live it and help somebody else in their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and help them grow while you're growing. A father may take, have to take a babe. A father may have to take a young child. That's the way it's supposed to work. Titus chapter number 1. The Bible says this. Paul, a servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the knowledge of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching. We saw that. On Wednesday night, which is commanded unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I have appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now, did you just see how that he mixed in father and elder now as we turn the page to the elder and take a look at that? You would think an elder, like I said, is, well, they're the, they're the great headiest one. They're, you know what? They're the ones that give the most. I've been around that before <laughs> where deacons were made deacons because they gave the most because the preacher knew their giving record. Well, this one guy's honest enough to know, and I know you know this too. Guys are put in deacon positions, not because they met the qualifications of leadership from 1 Timothy chapter number 3, and also in here, they were because they gave the most. I can tell you right now, I have no idea what you folks give. I have no idea. I've never asked Taylor one time, except for Brother Burke. I've never asked, <laughs> I've never asked one time. Well, he led, it, he led the door open, as in, Lord, you know, when you're in the court, and I asked a question, the judge allowed it, and he opened the door, and he says, I wrote free will tithe and offering on one of my checks. You get me a copy of that check. <laughs> Band of business. <laughs> no, I, I have no idea what you guys, you know what? It keeps it all on 11 playing ground, because you know what? Human nature is, oh, I give more, I get more. And I oh, he gives a lot. Maybe he's ready for leadership. No, man, that's not what qualifies you to be a, a father at this stage or an elder. It's your growth and your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ that you're now able to impart that to somebody else to pull them along up as you move on. Down. Folks, as you grow, grow and go on down the road, you're pulling people along with you, man. And you know what he says right here? <laughs> How could Paul tell Timoth, uh, Titus, mine own son after the faith? He says, you're my son. I've taught and trained you. You've been around me. You've been through the missionary trips, you've seen the ups and downs, you've seen, you've seen jails, you've seen beatings, you've seen it all. And you know what, now when you look to ordain elders in every city, you need to find somebody with these qualifications. You know what's weird? Paul never calls himself an elder, but he does call himself a father. Because he's not married, he doesn't meet the qualifications. Now there are qualifications for the elder right here, and I'm using it in a, in a broad sw uh, swipe this morning about your growth process with the Lord and where you're at regarding this particular stage. But you can have more than one elder in the church, you know. You can. I understand, like Brother Bird said, there always has to be somebody in charge, but you can have more than one elder in the church. 
But it doesn't go to the most senior person who's just stuck it out. It goes to the person God tells the preacher, says, yeah, they've been walking with the Lord, and you, you spend time with them. You can kind of sense that it's on their heart and on their mind and where they want to go. Uh, part of why you guys are teaching Sunday school, too, and you did it last summer, it, it is for you personally. It's for, it's for us as a congregation. It's for me, and it, it, but it's good for you individually. But you know, all kidding aside, I want to see if there's anything under the hood that maybe God's dealing with you about, about down the road. No. Oh, not me. I don't... You don't know it's not you. It won't be you. It'll be God dealing with you. Well, I don't like to publicly speak. I don't like to read. I don't like, who cares? Is it you doing it or the Spirit of God doing it? Oh, you, oh this because you have a big mouth and a personality. That, that's not part of the fruit of the Spirit. You just saw it this morning, man. <laughs> big mouth and personality are not part of the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> I like to think it is, but then you get up here and the Holy Ghost says, I'm leaving, going to another, I'm going to the Episcopalian church. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, can, you can struggle through that one with all your notes on your... T- I'm just saying that part of, the, part of this thing that you go through is preaching, getting along with the, God, uh, the Lord and teaching and getting that lesson for us is that maybe God's dealing with you about something in your life, about maybe going on further down the road to get to this stage where you're a leader and a participation in leadership where you can, you know, take a class and the preacher can trust you with that class. See, everybody gets all over Moses. I don't know why this is coming to heart and mind right now, but it just is. In Exodus 18, and I, I understand Jethro's a Midianite. I understand he's a, he's a, a heathen. I understand he's the priest of Midian. I understand his background. But you know what? I don't think he gives bad advice to Moses. I've heard my, my favorite preacher of all time says it's not good advice. I, I, don't, I, I disagree with it. I disagree with him not because I'm smart, but I disagree with it because... Moses is one man over 1.5 to 2 million people. How can he possibly meet Moses? We ran out of water today. Moses, we need oil. Moses, the cattle are hungry. So the, 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 Jethro gives the, the instructions that, Moses, you know what? Find some men you can trust. Some men you've watched and observed that have come through out of Egypt and that you can put over some things because you know what? You're going to wear away unless you invest your life in somebody. So that you can now have people under you who handle the day-to-day stuff. That can handle the, you know, we ran out of purple linen and we ran out of toilet paper out by the, you know, out by, out by the oasis, man. You, Moses, you can't do that. You'll lose your mind. You say, well, that's stupid. Acts chapter 6, don't they get seven men? It's not fit that we should leave prayer and the ministry of the word and serve tables. That doesn't mean it's a beneath job for you to serve tables. It means this is what God gave us to do, but we need some people we can trust to do that other stuff. So that's the stage of the Father, and it's, it's trying to get you guys, you know, maybe, maybe God wants me to do something greater in my life than just sit in church. Or maybe it just is, but you know what? You've been gifted, folks. The day God saved you, it's not just the eternal gift of eternal life with eternal salvation. He gifted you with something by the Holy Ghost for you to do something to benefit the body of Christ. And that's all part of this whole thing. And, and a father sees that and says, you know what? Why don't you, well, come on, come on, get up, teach us something. Why don't you leave singing? You're thinking right now, no way. I can't, I can't carry a tune with a, with a stinking handle. Well, I don't know what most of the songs are on Wednesday night, so come and laugh. And, yeah, let's, let's sing 666, Deb Cockshaw. Let's sing 666, verse 6. I don't know that one, man. But I mean, but I mean, you let people get involved, man. But as a father and an elder, you, you look at it and say, you know what, there's some potential there. It's Holy Ghost potential. And they got some desire and some zeal. You don't find that often nowadays in our circles. You try to nurture that thing and bring it along, man. I, I, I know we're, we're going all over the place, and it's good for you. It's built, it builds character. Go to, <laughs> I heard that snicker in the back, man. Go to First Peter, First Peter chapter 5. We got a couple more. I certainly will not be like Pharaoh in Sunday school and not let my people go. No. <laughs> That's good. Deb, you're not supposed to laugh at that, man. It's, supposed to, it's probably that quiet, that quiet spirit, man. I don't know, man. <laughs> First Peter. That's the best part. We're just so... Uh, it's a ship of fools. With your captain at the helm. It's awesome, man. All right, First Peter chapter number five. I know we've been here multitude of times. We were here in Sunday school. We've been here before, but... 
Give me a little latitude here. The Bible says this, verse number one, the elders which are among you, plural, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. That's because he was up on the Mount of Transfiguration, second coming, not the rapture. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and giveth grace to the humble. There's elders involved here. Peter is an elder. But who is the elder in subjection to? The chief shepherd. You know who the pastor has to answer to? Besides his wife. You know, after, you know who the pastor answer, has to answer to? the chief shepherd. You know, who, you know who you get your marching orders from if you're a, at this stage? I, I, know it's, I know it's for all saved people, you get your marching orders for Jesus Christ, but specifically, when you have a position of leadership and ministry leadership, and you are participating in leadership, you better have some time alone with Jesus Christ and your Father and that book and get your orders from him. Because you're going to have to say things that nobody on the face of this earth will ever believe came from you. No, they came from God. Well, why are you hard on them like that? Why are you harsh to that? Why did you say that right there? And I understand people say, well, he's just being carnal. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe you just weren't prepared to receive it like you should have received it. And maybe that, that comment, that sharpness that God gave to the man, he gave them a gift of sharpness. That's in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number thir- uh, 10, I believe it is. The gift of sharpness to deal with that, folks, to edify them. But you won't get that if you're not spending time alone in that book in this father and elder stage. Well, we all have to do that, say people, preacher. I understand that. But I'm talking about when you're acceler- you're in this stage, you best not get up in that pulpit with your own ideas. Yeah. You better not get up there with your own thoughts or something you snipped from the internet. Because whatever came on that internet was what God gave that man. I'm not saying we don't steal from one another or borrow from one another. You know why? Because none of it is ours, it's his. But I'm talking about when you intentionally preach something that somebody else gave in the exact same tone, and the exact same uh, you know, emulation. There's something wrong. You know why, Father, Elder, you're, you know why you're not fit for this stage? Because you're not spending time alone with the Father. Didn't, didn't First John chapter 2 say, you fathers, you've been with him from the beginning. It's relationship as a father and an elder in this position. And you can't feed the flock of God and you can't take the oversight unless you're spending time alone with the chief shepherd. This, el- this elder father thing, it's, honestly, this is the real deal. Uh, there's a lot of folks that are in, and I, I'm saying this, you know, you, you say, well, you're a newbie, you don't know anything. Well, I've been around it for a long time. But to the pa- you're, you're right, to the pastor, but I've had the opportunity over the years to get involved in a lot of stuff. And there's a lot of folks that are pastors, or let me say this, they're elders and fathers over congregations because their mommy or their daddy want them to be. They went to Bible school because mom or dad went to Bible school, or you know, daddy was a preacher, granddad was a preacher. It's the family business, you know. The family business? How about you be about your father's business and go be the best electrician you can for Jesus Christ and not mess the pulpit up? Because this is not a joke, man. Having the elder and father say, This you're in, man. This is not Ezekiel up to the ankles, knees, and thighs. No, you're you're floating the river, man. You're in. This is it. You're all in, buddy. Uh, you do know, and folks who pastored, or you, if you've had the charge over people, jail minister, or this, you do know we have to give an account for the people we've been over, whether it's discipling or whether it's jail. or We have to give an account for that. Well, I get to be the preacher. Oh, good luck with that when you meet the chief shepherd. You better have your relationship squared away with them because that's who we answer to. And you better take the oversight, not because of money, but because you love your Savior and you love the people you're ministering to. It's hard, man. People are rough to deal with, especially the one in the mirror, man. He's the toughest one to get along with. Second John. Second John, please. Give me... Uh, man, we're not going to go to the book of Acts. No, no, no particular reason to, to do that this morning, I don't believe, as things are playing out. Look at what the Bible says to me over in Second uh, John. Second John chapter 2. Ah, see, that yeah, it's good. good. It's good to see some of you paying attention, man. Honey, where's chapter two? Do you have that? In? You got you got that one? Quiet down, woman. Quiet. Anyway, <laughs> Second John chapter number 
<laughs> There's only one chapter. I hate saying that chapter thing. Second John verse one says the now now how many of you now all kidding aside, I think I, we we're brother Bert and I talking. How many of you ever knew John? How many of you ever knew John the apostle was an elder, or even picked it up or thought about it? Look what the Bible says, the elder unto the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Go with me over to 3 John, please. 3 John. Look at verse number 1. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. How could John say that unless he had been there himself already and he says, you guys come with me? I, I want, you know what? I want the very best for you. When I say I want you folks to have more at the judgment seat of Christ than me, I mean that. I hope, I hope God backs up that humongous Goliath caterpillar tractor and just dumps like everything he can on you because you do it with the right attitude, the right heart at the right time. And God says, here you go. I hope to God you get that. Seriously. That's the job of an elder or a father. Is to bring people along. You're, you're full blown. This is it. Your participation in leadership, ministry leadership, you're here. You are actually the, you're the one people turn to for answers in their lives. When the baby dies, man, when the cancer doesn't go away and the car wreck happens. All the fun stuff nobody talks about. Well, I get to teach the Bible. Well, yeah, this is probably the best part of the week. Between struggling with your prayer life and your vision and your eyes and your heart and your thoughts and hatred and bitterness and wrath and envy and everything else. I, I'm just talking to myself right now. You guys probably don't go through that stuff. I'm just saying that, that, that that's what the reality of it is, man, is that this is probably the best time of the week, man. To get up, not because I get to preach. It's because... There's really not much bothering me or distracting me right now, man. But then when you get out of here and you're left with your own thoughts and you've got to deal with people and people call you and, oh, yeah, man. It's, it's, but that's this stage. You're all, this, is, this is leadership in ministry. You're, you're, you're in, man. Elder, deacon, the pastor. Got a Sunday school yourself. Well, I get to teach Sunday school. Do you, do you understand you're responsible for the five to six to seven people you have? to pray for them consistently, to help them out in their questions, to deal with them in their lives when life doesn't go so well for them while your life is falling apart. That's the real deal of the growth process. And you know I love all the Bible verses, we, 100%. We love all the doctrines, and we should. But the practicality of taking all the verses and all the doctrine, and I'm a King James only... Well, we've got to put that into practice, man. Because I'm going to... Wouldn't it be weird? Now, I know, I know we get glorified bodies in, in, in heaven. I understand that. And the, it's the inner man. I understand all that. And flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I understand that. We get, we get a glorified body like, fashion like unto his. I understand that. Wouldn't it be weird if God just turned you into what your spiritual stage really was for like a second or two? And there's just like a whole sea of babies in front of the judgment seat of Christ because we just couldn't get along with each other. And there's like two elders there. There's two young men. He sees it a lot different than you and I do. Imagine if he just let that glorified body just stay just long enough for us to look around the judgment seat. And he kept you in the stage that you went up into glory as. And it wasn't what you thought you were. And you go to heaven and you're like a four-year-old for like a second. You say it's on the Bible. I know it's not. Neither of the stupid things you watch on TV, but I let it go. <laughs> so I'm just saying to you that, is that this, we've got one more next week. Thank God the tribulation period's almost over. I hope you do sincerely, and I hope sincerely, look at ourselves in light of this mirror as to how God looks at us and considers our... We're not to stay stagnant, man. We're supposed to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Brother Steve Naroff, would you pray for us this morning? Please close us out, if you could. Father, we thank you for your book today. And we do without it, Lord. Yeah, amen. Thank amen. By yeah, amen. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I'm on precept upon precept, preparing to spend time with spiritual. Thank you for
with a lesson on spiritual growth. I think about the verse, Lord, that says that uh, some man came out of the world to minister to him, but to minister to the righteous, to grant him to many. And I know that all men seek not their own, seek their own, not the things of Jesus Christ. And in the flesh, Lord, we, we do seek our own. Yeah. If we let Christ be formed in us, let us grow into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It's about serving others, Lord, esteeming others better than ourselves. Amen. Laying it down our lives to the brethren, being more like Jesus Christ, that we can not seek our own, but to minister and to see the other people grow, and uh, we can get the glory through it all. I pray we ponder these things in our heart. That we Amen. Spirit, take the word of God and help us to remember it, not forget it. Bless the day. I thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah, amen. We love you because you first loved us. We love your book. Yeah, amen. Bring forth fruit through this message. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.